I'm Annie Lowry. I am a staff writer at The Atlantic, and I also wrote a book called Give People Money, which is about universal basic income, uh, which came out, I guess, two years ago. Um, and I'm delighted to be joined by my friend Sebastian Johnson, who is a philanthropic strategist. He's a great thinker on social policy. He's a writer. Um, and we are really happy to be here to do a social distancing social. Um, you guys are tantalizingly close to happy hour there on the East Coast, but not, not yet, and definitely not here on the West Coast. Um, and this is uh, by Future Tense, which is, of course, a partnership of Slate, New America, and Arizona State University. And today we're going to talk about universal basic income and specifically whether UBI makes sense even in the context not of a pandemic. Um, but I kind of wanted to start off. Sebastian, by talking about whether it makes sense in this pandemic, right? Like how, how would this extraordinary, horrific crisis in public health and economic terms be different if the government had already been sending folks checks of sort of $500 or $1,000 a month? I don't know if, if that's something that you've thought through. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks for that question, Annie. Um, I think that one of the first things that we kind of need to grapple with when we're thinking about the current economic crisis is that this is the first recession that has started in the service sector. Um, and, and why is that different? Why is that different from the last recession that started in the financial sector and, and previous economic downturns? Um, if you look at the 100 million workers in the private service sector, they make up 70% of our total non-farm employment. And for every $1 million in real spending in our economy, there are 15 employees in the service sector versus four employees in the durable goods or manufacturing sector. So what that means is that the contagion uh, in terms of the economic crisis coming from the service sector, taking all those people out of work, uh, is going to trickle down and, and cause uh, slack and demand uh, across other productive sectors who you might not think would be hit by uh, this crisis. So thinking about right now the glut in the oil market, a part of that is the total drop of demand in this sector. Um, the other part of why, you know, UBI and, and cash transfers are so needed in this economic downturn is that this is not, you know, similar to the Great Recession, where the issue was that there was a liquidity trap or that credit had dried up and that, you know, there just wasn't enough money moving around in the economy, um, the Fed has already, through monetary policy, brought our interest rates to zero. They're encouraging borrowing at record speeds and, and backstopping a lot of loans. But if there is no productive place for those loans and those dollars to go because demand has, has fallen, then the Fed is going to be really hamstrung on how it can respond. And so fiscal policy, making sure that we get money into people's hands, is really one of the best things that the government can do right now to prevent um, a lot of the economic downturn from being permanent and the dislocation from being permanent, uh, but also because um, you, you would think that demand will go back up once the health crisis has passed and some of the uh, freeing up of dollars for borrowing and lending is not really the right response. Yeah, I think that that is a, a really important and interesting way to put it. And so, you know, one thing that, that people who, who think about UBI as a policy a lot um, one of the distinctions that they draw is that it's not really a welfare policy. It is an insurance policy. So, you know, something like um, TANF, so the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families program, that, that goes primarily to moms with young kids, um, and it tries to keep them in the labor force, but provides them with small amounts of cash. Uh, that's, that's a welfare policy, right? Like that's, that's aimed at policy, poverty alleviation. Mm -hmm. um, but UBI is, is an insurance policy, sort of like social security. It's, mm -hmm. it's meant to be there as a buffer to help people through all sorts of circumstances. And one thing that I think is interesting about this is, you know, a $500 check is not going to get anybody it's going to do a lot for a lot of people, but it's not really a poverty solution. You could take a very low income family or a homeless person um, uh, or anybody else going through really hard times. 500 bucks is not, it's not enough to do it, but um, it would act as that kind of buffer against the sort of worst, worst things that can happen. Sorry, we're being joined by my 
co-authors, Calvin, <laughs> Cassie, who have all of a sudden, now that I'm doing this, have become very active down here. Um, and that's the thing, you know, we don't have a tremendous amount of social insurance in this country as a general point, uh, just to help people keep the lights on. And I think that that is something that we're, we're seeing right now, as you point out, with these workers who, these jobs were great and they were in pretty, pretty uh, tough economic conditions even before this utterly unprecedented crisis. I don't know if there's anything in there that you want to pick up on. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll pick up on on two of the points that you made, and I think the overarching, um, you know, theme of that is that the pandemic has really exposed um, the precarious nature of work mm -hmm. and our economy that was always there underneath the trends. You know, we, we've all heard the the stat that forty percent of households can't afford a four hundred dollar expense, and I think we're seeing that very clearly. Um, and then the early evidence from how the stimulus payments that have already gone out are being used is that they're being used for the essentials. It's food, uh, medical payments, and gas. Mm -hmm. uh, but at a in a larger sense, I think that two arguments in particular that UBI advocates have made uh, that are being borne out by this current crisis. One is that it really doesn't make sense to mediate our social safety net through employment. Um, you know, we, we have an unemployment a system that is difficult to navigate. It's different from state to state. Um, you know, some states have, have created burdens to accessing unemployment, um, you know, in, in an intentional way to, to keep the, the eligibility and roles down. Um, people have lost their jobs, which means that they've lost their health insurance, which is catastrophic in, a, in the middle of a, of a public health crisis. And so really, you know, thinking about why we mediate our programs through employment uh, needs to be kind of, as we rebuild after this, one of the things that, that Congress really uh, you know, takes to heart. And then I think the other uh, argument that a lot of UBI experts and, and advocates have made is that there is a lot of essential work that is done in our economy that is totally not valued by the economy. Most of it in the care uh, and service and domestic sector. Um, so when you look at um, the jobs that have been lost, most of them have been in leisure and hospitality. 60% of those job losses are borne by women. 52% uh, of people under the age of 45, this was something that you lifted up last week in the Atlantic, 52% of those people under the age of 45 have lost their job or been put on leave or had their hours reduced. And so there's a generational aspect of this. Um, and then there's also, of course, uh, the, the racial uh, you know, dynamic here that we can't ignore, which is that many of the essential jobs uh, are held by women of color in particular, also uh, low-income families, uh, also the immigrant community. And if you contrast that also with the essential workers, the people who haven't lost their jobs, uh, they are also disproportionately women, uh, disproportionately people of color, and the third of those people are over the age of 50. And so they're exposing themselves to these health crises every day, taking it back to their families, disproportionately low income, disproportionately without health insurance. And so I think that th th that dichotomy between who's losing jobs and who still has to work, um, that really shows that there's a lot of essential work in our economy that is not valued by the economy and that we need a social safety net for those folks. And we need to have a social way that we can value that uh, and put a fair fair dollar amount on it. Yeah, I think that that's right. And to, to pick up on, to sort of piggyback on the point that you're making, I think that there's this idea out there that these jobs that have either gotten wiped away or that people are being asked to do, even though those jobs are dangerous now, so whether that is picking up trash or working in a hospital or doing food service work where you're exposed in a way, you know, there's this kind of argument or, um, you know, working elsewhere in the food supply chain. So in places like slaughterhouses, on farms, picking vegetables, doing all of that, there's this argument out there that, you know, the reason that those are low wage, low benefit jobs is because, you know, they're not jobs with a tremendous um, uh, increase in skill over time uh, or care work, right? These are not jobs that are affected by technology. You don't tend to need um, a higher education degree. And that, you know, that that justifies them being bad jobs. That this is just econ 101. This is how the economy works. It is just a given. 
and I really feel like that absolves us and absolves policy that these jobs are bad because we choose to let them be bad, right? <laughs> like, or we choose to let them be dangerous. It's not a given. We do all sorts of things through policy. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and I think that you're right to draw, draw out that intersection of race and gender, as well as the immigration angle, that, you know, these, this is a reflection of structural inequality as well. And we have a tremendous number of policies that we know can address that structural inequality, but, you know, for complicated and not, <laughs> not fun reasons, we, we choose not to, right? Um, and I think that you're right, like thinking about divorcing insurance from employment um, is something that most, almost other, all other OECD countries have chosen to do, right? We are pretty unusual in that we have um, an extremely health, expensive health system um, that is not better than most other countries' health systems in terms of outcomes um, and is also employment dependent, which there's, there's a real perversity to that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so, you know, one thing, and I, I want to go actually back to something that you had said before, which is, you know, people are talking about cash transfers now as being kind of stimulus, but it was something that you were saying at the beginning that like, it's not even actually really stimulus given that the economy is so shut down, right? It's this life, it's this lifeline, like, we're not going to get the economy back to where it was, right? Like this is just helping people kind of keep the lights on. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, I mean, it's something that I'm really worried about is in a couple months, as you point out, when we just have this sort of self-generating recession coming from all of these families being really insecure, you know? Um, and I'm wondering, have you thought about whether you feel like, you know, we have this kind of one-time cash infusion that Congress passed that goes up to middle-income families, um, but, you know, what it would look like to, to, you know, do we need to send more cash than that? Should we be doing it on an ongoing basis? What would that look like? What kind of policy goal would we achieve with that? Yeah, um, absolutely. I want to I wanna pick up on mm -hmm. uh, a couple of things that you just mentioned. One being um, kind of the structural inequality. Um, it is both a fact of our economy, but it's also we're now starting to understand how it's by design. Um, when you have policymakers um, on both sides of the aisle who are saying we can't make it too comfortable to be on unemployment or make the, the benefits too generous because people won't come back, that's an implicit uh, acknowledgement, I think, that um, the, the overwhelming power that employers have over workers to set the terms of their employment, to engage them in precarious, low-wage uh, work that is um, conditional and when you don't have any any um, set number of hours the 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 low wages and and the structure and nature of that work are intentional and so when we do start to unpack why is it that we mediate our social safety net through employment I think that's a huge part mm -hmm. um, the other part I think is that we have a real um, allergy to universal programs and we really uh, and I think that, you know, this is progressives and, and conservatives alike. We want to target the programs to the folks that we are politically aligned with. And so um, I think you saw this in, in the first CARES Act. So uh, we, we spent $2 trillion, and yet there were some administrative challenges and some, and some other issues with how that money was, was given out. It, it left out college students, which was a huge gap, left out adults with disabilities, huge gap there. The Republicans tried to target their dollars to small businesses, but because of a loophole that big businesses lobby for, uh, you know, they pretty much exhausted those dollars that were meant for, uh, you know, struggling small businesses to survive. And so, um, I think that another thing that we really need to to address is kind of this emphasis on having benefits be targeted and kind of the lie that that's always a much more effective way to get benefits out. Um, but to your point about whether or not we need additional dollars, I think it is um, obvious that we're gonna need additional money to people above and beyond the, the stimulus check and the unemployment insurance that's been extended. Um, there is the, uh, the Emergency Money for the People Act that uh, Representative Rokana has, has introduced, supported by the Economic Security Project, uh, which calls for expanding relief to $2,000 and a monthly payment for every qualifying American over the age of 16. 
uh, with the trigger that it is going to be sent out every month until employment returns to normal. And then I think that this bill also does a couple other things in terms of the administration and making sure that you are casting as wide and net as possible. It's making it possible for immigrants who don't have social security numbers, but who do file their taxes to be eligible for that payment. It makes it so that you can receive uh, your, your stimulus dollars in different ways other than just a check or a uh, deposit to a specific bank, looking at ways that uh, cash, uh, cash transfer apps can be utilized. Um, but you know, I, I do think that a much more robust stimulus is necessary, and I, I think that Congress is going to find that um, without that, we're we're looking at a prolonged crisis. Mm -hmm. So I just want to pick up on on two things that you you said there. So the first is um, on the administrative burden on the government. So I think one thing that this crisis revealed is that the government doesn't have great ways to push money out to people really quickly. Um, we can send checks. Uh, that goes through the IRS, but then you run into all of the issues of people who have unstable addresses, who don't file their taxes for whatever reason. A lot of folks don't have to file taxes and therefore um, it's hard to reach them. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have immediate cash payments. We don't have postal banking. Um, and countries that are much poorer than the US that have far less state capacity have really figured this out. I think it's a thing that Americans don't realize, but um, it was uh, in 2008 that Britain decided that it needed a way to send cash payments to everybody and that they wanted the cash payments to be immediate. And so they just threw their equivalent to the Federal Reserve, decided that they would you know, give themselves the capacity to do this. And many, many, many lower income countries have done it. Um, so I think you're right that you know, this question of, do we just need a way to get money to everybody mm -hmm. um, uh, going forward? And because especially the people who you want the money to get the most. So we are saying that the people who are lowest income, who are dealing with disabilities, who have kids in their household, we really want to get money to them. Those are also the people who in a lot of cases are going to be less likely um, to have up to date direct deposit information on file with the IRS for a whole host of reasons. Um, but this is not, it's a technical policy challenge, but it's hardly hardly that big of one if you put your mind to it and then the second thing is I, I i i go back and forth and i think this is such a complicated policy question but on the left there has been for decades now right this this rift on targeted programs versus universal programs um so on the one hand in a high inequality country where a lot of our problems stem from the fact that we don't do enough to remedy inequality um, there's a need for probably more redistribution and more progressive policy, which necessarily means means testing. Mm -hmm. Yet, on the other hand, we also don't have universal programs, which means that huge numbers of people fall through the cracks. And I think that there is a tension there and that people, you know, can really debate. And, and I guess it, it is, it's one of the, it's one of the central features of UBI that everybody is getting it. And so you get these kind of inevitable questions about, well, why does it make sense for Bill Gates to be getting the same amount of money as a single mom with three kids who's working two jobs? And I think the answer is it doesn't, but maybe it makes sense for everybody to be getting something. So I don't know how you feel about that, about that tension between living in a high inequality country with um, that remains high inequality after the tax and transfer system is done, and also the kind of pressure for universality, given that, as you point out, right, like we splice people into really small groups, into the deserving and undeserving, and that has all sorts of policy consequences. Yeah, and that, that I think really kind of is the crux of um, the, the debate over, over UBI, particularly, you know, as you point out, you know, with here in DC policy circles and progressive policy circles, um, I think that for me, uh, it's both uh, an issue of policy design, but also political will. Mm -hmm. That when you create targeted programs, it makes those, number one, the program is not going to meet, it's not going to be extensive enough to meet everyone who's eligible for the program. Um, because there's going to be some kind of gate that you're using to determine who is and who is not eligible. And just the act of having that gate or that, that you know, that need to show that you're eligible is going to keep people out who, uh, for, for whatever reason, lack the capacity to, to, to make it past that gate. Um, and I think that also when you target programs from a political standpoint, 
it's easy to describe the person who is receiving the, the benefit as somehow deficient or undeserving. Um, and I think that is particularly true here in the United States, where we have a very deeply ingrained cultural narrative around deserving and undeserving poor. Um, the second part, you know, kind of grappling with why should someone um, who is wealthy get the benefit of a program? Um, I think that it, it's, it's a matter of, of the argument you're making. So everyone can go to the library. Um, we don't, you know, there's not a means test for being able to visit a library. But, you know, some people pay more in their local taxes, property taxes or income taxes for that service than others. And so I think that making, making it understood that when we talk about UBI, we're talking about a public utility like a library. We're talking about public or social insurance like something that is available or accessible to everyone. And then coupling that with the progressive tax system that says the things that we pay for together, we're all gonna contribute according to our means is, is one way to get around that. Mm -hmm. um, it, but, but I do, you know, to, to your point, like it, it is a question of political will. It's, it's does that resonate with people? Mm -hmm. um, I think what's encouraging is, is in this moment of, of crisis, which is really a moment where solidarity is needed now more than ever, um, you know, there's a recent poll that showed that direct cash transfers are popular across the political spectrum. So we're talking about 88% of all voters and 87% of Republican voters. Like there's a reason that Mitt Romney was able to outflank House Democrats on calling for cash transfers. And that is because people understand in this moment of crisis that, that there's going to need to be some level of, of solidarity and that we're all in this together. And so I hope that this is part of, of the way in which our political conversation is transformed after, after this crisis, is that we understand uh, what, what are the things that we all need to contribute to? How do we make sure that everyone in our society is, is safe, is healthy, and has what they need in terms of basic necessities to survive? Um, and then how do we pay for that in a way that is fair? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one thing that I, I really like that you said is that, you know, yes, there is a tension between universality and means testing, perhaps, um, but those are not necessarily polar opposites. You can, in fact, have uh, the provision of public goods, social insurance, universal programs, and also have a system that's ameliorating the worst effects of high inequality. And that you know maybe it's a bit of a policy puzzle, but again, it's it's not it's not an unsolvable equation at all. And I think that you're right that one thing I'm curious to know, and I really don't know the answer to this, and I don't think anybody does yet, is to what extent does does this crisis change hearts and minds on the need for public goods for universal programs for the government to get better at doing counter cyclical policy <laughs> for this to become more automatic for it to be easy to file for things like unemployment insurance and food stamps um, because you know and this is something that you pointed out we've been by design made these programs complicated difficult we have underfunded the agencies that implement them. And so in the worst case scenario, you end up with what Florida is going through right now, where in the midst of, of a terrifying pandemic that is killing people, you're asking people to submit paper applications and you're having them line up. It's complete madness. Um, and again, just in terms of other countries have nice things that we don't, there's no reason that this stuff can't be done online, that it can't be more automatic, that you can't get a policy determination in 24 hours. Um, and, and, you know, but it takes investing in these, in these systems that have been really underfunded. And one thing that I would draw out here is, you know, we're generally talking about federal programs, but the fact that these programs often get devolved to the states, on the one hand means that some states have really great, innovative, aggressive policy, but it means that many states don't, and they, they purposefully don't um and i think that that actually taught that ties in with the you know the the racial um uh, uh valences to this which are really really important there's obviously um a really vital history of uh racial exclusion that sort of explains why we have these these systems in the way that we do um but yeah coming back around to it i do i just wonder how much this is going to change things and kind of a good government like let's get government to work so that the next time this happens 
we don't have people lining up in Florida for hours to submit UI. Um, whether that that change will happen. I I mean I I I'm I hope so. Um, my worry is that you know I, it, for me it all it always comes back to um, who does it benefit for things to be broken, um, yeah. and I think that th this moment where we're seeing social safety net programs kind of fall apart, I think that um, there, there's an ideological commitment to that, that government can't do this. Um, and I think that there's also a financial incentive because if government can't do it, then someone else has to do it. And that's usually mm -hmm. a private entity. Um, and so I think you're seeing some resistance um, from conservatives on the Hill who are saying, you know, if we implement all of this stuff and it goes well, then we're gonna have a hard time pulling it back. Um, and then I also think that there's a preference in policy to want to, as we mediate through employers, to also mediate any government help through private firms. Um, I think so you, you can take something, for example, like um, higher education. We used to just collect tax dollars and give those tax dollars to uh, universities and colleges to pay their budgets directly, public universities and colleges. Now we ask individuals to take on a massive amount of debt, which is managed by uh, private debt uh, debt collection agencies, to go to college, and then your income is then uh, uh, a funding stream for that entity, and and they can chop that funding stream up and sell it on financial markets. And so I think looking at why it is that our public services need to number one be mediated by private services but also why they are often dysfunctional when they are purely public i think is is kind of a big mm -hmm. um unspoken ideological commitment and in a lot of our provision of public welfare at the federal and the state level mm -hmm. and i think that you're right that you know it's it's an argument implicit in what we've been talking about that the great thing about cash transfers and you can look at the social security system which is enormously cheap to run and extremely, extremely efficient. Um, I remember uh, when my son was born, we received his social security card without having to do almost anything. It just showed up, right? <laughs> like we didn't have to pay anything, nothing. It just did, they knew our address somehow and they, they sent it along. Um, the, the cash is easy. And universality is easy. You, you don't have to be splicing people. You don't really need to be involving tons of private firms. There's no securitization <laughs> necessary. Um, mm -hmm. And you know that 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 it's easy for the IRS or another agency to do. So um, so we just we're just about 1:30 here. So I just want to encourage folks to use if you have questions for me and Sebastian, um, you can use that Q and A function and send them along. And then we'll both be um, responding to them. Uh, so go ahead and do that if you if you have questions that you would like us to respond to. I'm just going to look and see what we have for questions here. Um, just give me one second to pull this up. Okay, so we have some questions from Zoom. So UBI proposals are often discussed in the range of a thousand dollars a month. For this reason, they are often deemed outrageous due to the high price tag. Might a small UBI, say $100 or $200 a month, be a better place to start? What sort of difference would $100 or $200 a month make on the lower end of the income sale? Although such a small amount of money wouldn't go far, it would work as a less costly experiment and open the pipeline to a higher UBI in the long run, maybe. Um, so do you want to address that question, Sebastian? Yeah, um, I think that the, the $1,000 a month came from uh, the federal poverty line of, of about $12,000. And I think that's why a lot of folks have, have kind of latched onto that, that number. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think that any, any UBI is better than no UBI. And, and yep. if, if there was appetite on, on the Hill right now on, on the left and the right to pass $200 universal basic income, uh, that would be phenomenal. And I think that that would make a huge impact on the margins, particularly for families who are struggling to put food on the table, struggling to, to buy gas, despite the uh, astronomically low price of gas. Um, I, do, I do think it is gonna be insufficient. You know, I, I think that uh, we, we just recently had a stimulus check of $1,200 that most people, 
either, you know, they pay for basics or they paid their mortgage and, and then they were exhausted. And so um, if we're really talking about meeting people's needs, it's probably going to be need to be uh, closer to the two thousand dollar number that the uh, Emergency Money to the People Act is, is advocating for. Um, but, you know, I, I think that any any amount is 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 better than none. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I think that those are all really smart points. I feel like the question is, what do you, what what problem are you trying to solve with UBI, right? Are you just ideologically committed to UBI? In which case, a thousand dollars a month, it's not so much money that you're going to disincentivize work too much if that's important to you. Um, but you know, the basic and basic income is that it's supposed to keep you out of poverty, right? Just provide for basic expenses. So notably, you know, for a family of four, uh, $4,000 a month, right? Like that, that goes quite a long way. Um, I would just like to point out that there are kind of two proposals that are sort of UBI adjacent, but that I think are really good ideas. Um, so one is the, the much touted UBI for kids. So um, children are enormously economically vulnerable in the United States. The US um, has a child poverty rate, which is about four times the rate of some of our peer countries like Denmark. Um, and other countries uh, provide cash to parents to spend on kids. Kids are very expensive. Again, they're very economically vulnerable. This would be a lot cheaper and it would be, I think, easier to sort of frame as an investment, right? Like we don't want kids to grow up in poverty. We've said as a country that, you know, we want to make sure that, that children are not punished for, um, uh, you know, the family that they grow up in. So that's one kind of cheaper option. I also note, you know, if you just want to do straightforward poverty elimination and see how that works out, there's something called negative income taxes, where we could basically make sure that everybody is getting up above the poverty line. Luke Schaefer at the University of Michigan has a great proposal for this with some of his co-authors. And the math on that is not... It's not terrifying. It's something like, it depends on obviously how the economy is doing, but it's something like $200 billion a year, which I'm not saying that's not a lot of money, um, but it's, it's nothing like the back of the envelope math that you get with a UBI. So I would say if you're looking for ways to make UBI less scary, um, cash transfers for kids or the straightforward elimination of poverty, it's probably a good way to go. Um, the economist Claudia Som, among other people, also has a proposal. So once the unemployment rate starts going up, you just send cash to people. So it's just a counter cyclical policy. And I also really like that proposal. So there's lots of ways to do this. Um, because, you know, right now, the cash transfer, you know, policies that we have, they're either Social Security, which is untouchable and works really well and is great, or they're TANF, which is heavily stigmatized, unbelievably underfunded, deeply punitive, terrible for people who participate in that program and doesn't even work that well. Um, and so, you know, I think that there's something to learn from that. So all right, I'm going to go look at, we have some more questions here. So um, some countries with a UBI have a sovereign wealth fund. Alaska has its oil revenue fund. Should the United States designate some kind of separate funding source for a national UBI? Does it make more sense for our large economy to fund one the normal way, which would just be through the tax system, I imagine? Um, so yeah, do you have thoughts on that, Sebastian, on, on funding? Um, I mean, I, I'll say personally that I'm, I'm agnostic on, on the way uh, to fund UBI. I think that there's a lot of uh, innovative ways out there that people have proposed. Um, obviously, the Sovereign Wealth Fund model has has worked enormously well in Alaska and Norway. Um, the issue with that is is it depends on, you know, is that sovereign wealth fund based on a commodity? Uh, you know, we've seen in previous downturns when the price of oil drops that the payment from the Alaska Permanent Fund also could have a corresponding decrease. And so that's something to think about. Um, if you're doing a sovereign wealth fund, are, are there tax revenues that you can be using as the basis of that fund, like a financial transactions tax? Uh, Andrew Yang has, has uh, promoted the, the value added tax. Are, you, are there ways in which you can devote uh, tax revenues into specific funds that are then reinvested in, in private markets to earn a return? I think that's another way rather than doing just a, 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 a classic kind of tax and transfer program. Um, I think that you know all of that does really kind of have to be on the table. Um, I think that you could have a robust sovereign wealth fund with a variety of uh, diverse funding streams to protect against any kind of downturn in, in one commodity or one funding stream or another. Uh, but I think that 
you know, again, uh, it kind of comes down to like, what is the political will? If, if we decide that we want to, you know, I, I think if, if anything, this crisis has shown that when people want to spend money, they have no problem borrowing the money to, to do so. You know, one of the things that people are angry about is the fact that we spent $2 trillion on a tax cut, you know, just two years ago. Most of that went to the very wealthy and, and corporations, and then they still turned around and needed another $2 trillion bailout just two years later. And so, you know, I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to, you know, the, the pay for argument and that, and the fact that we do need to have uh, a healthy kind of, kind of fiscal ledger for, for the country and for, for our states in particular who are, who have to balance budgets. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, we have all of this borrowing capacity right now. That's been the primary way that we have responded to this crisis. Why don't we use that borrowing capacity to support working families, to support communities who have found their only means of livelihood wiped out instead of doing what we usually do, which is funnel that money into tax cuts or funnel that money into, into unproductive sectors of the economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I feel like the question of whether we should have a sovereign wealth fund is somewhat distinct from the question of whether that sovereign wealth fund should be used for UBI. Mm -hmm. I think, as you point out, if we want a UBI and we want that to be part of our social policy spending mix, mm -hmm. I, I kind of think that you, you know, um, an economist would say that, you know, it's this illusion that we tax and then we spend, right? Like we spend and then we tax and those are actually kind of distinct processes. And I think that there are a lot of ways we could do both things in a smarter fashion. Um, and so kind of complicatedly tying the two together, I feel like is per perhaps unnecessary. Although, again, I do think this question of whether we should have kind of a sovereign wealth identity is, is a really interesting one. And it isn't one that I've thought about. There are a number of, and you gestured to a number of interesting proposals about do we want to carbon tax and dividend? Do we want a financial transaction tax and dividend? Um, and thinking about policies, framing them as, as dividends. But again, I, I tend to think of that as being more about how you're communicating about the policy than about actually how you're financing it. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I think it's a really interesting question, especially going forward. Um, okay, so we're gonna go some more questions. Um, so uh, going back to what one of you mentioned, the American mindset that poor people need to work like the rest of us, and the freeloaders that we pass out checks, what's a way to nudge that mindset? That's a question from Zoom. Yeah, I, I mean, that is, if, if, if whoever figures that out is, will probably be president. Uh, because it, I think that that is so, uh, fundamental to, I think, what the core of, of, of how people think the economy works, which is that you work hard, you're successful. Um, and if you're not, if you haven't been successful, if you don't have resources, if you don't have a job, there's something wrong with you, and that's why. Um, and I, I think I alluded to it, you know, there, I saw um, a tweet that was like, you know, these people who are just sitting at home gathering unemployment, um, you know, they're making more money than the people who are doing essential work. So, you know, how is that fair? And I think that the, the, the point the person was trying to make was that essential workers should be paid more. Um, but people, plenty of people make that argument to say that we need to be providing less in benefits. Um, and then there's also this corresponding belief that, you know, there's a disincentive to work. Um, I, like to, I like to say that, that work, if the disincentive is the work, if, 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 sitting, if staying home and and not working and, and earning income in that way is better than working then the disincentive is is the work that's being offered um and and so really trying to understand like what is it about these jobs um being so precarious and terrible that they and also low paid that we have to have no safety net so people are forced to do them um I hope that at the end of the day, you know, in, in the spirit of solidarity and, and, and understanding that we're all in this together, that people's mindsets will be shifted. You're already seeing um, a real emergence of some class consciousness, particularly around essential versus non-essential work, mm -hmm. who gets to stay home, who, who has to go out, um, whether that is, you know, kind of a, 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 a leftist or progressive class consciousness that kind of interrogates 
uh, corporations and the economic elite, or if it's a right wing based class consciousness that's more about the other and 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 who who is undeserving and and draining our our national greatness you know that that remains to be seen but um i do think that there will be some kind of shift politically um after mm -hmm. this crisis yeah um i think that this is a really hard thing to do um i think especially um you know um there's a tremendous amount of scholarship um, around why it is that we have such punitive social programs. Um, and I, I think, again, you don't, there's no answer that doesn't kind of come back to the racial history of the country and the racial makeup of the country. Um, so there's a really good book on, on this um, by Joe Sauce and a bunch of co-authors called Disciplining the Poor. Um, and I think it's just a really hard, I don't, I don't think that you can kind of reason your way out of this because we do have a tremendous amount of scholarship that shows what happens when you give people money, um, which is that they don't tend to spend more on vice goods. Uh, mm -hmm. They just tend to spend more on what they were spending on before. Um, and in some cases it can really act as um, an investment, um, especially in the lives of their kids. Um, I wish I had a good answer, but I think that fundamentally you're trying to answer the question of how do you make people less racist? And I, my guess is that a lot of people who are not me have really great thoughts on how to do that and not do that, but that's not, um, that's not something that I feel like I necessarily have a great answer. My colleague Ibram Kendi does a tremendous amount of research on this. Um, but I do think that one thing you can do, one argument for universal programs is that they don't become racialized in the same way that targeted programs do. Um, you know, there's this, despite the fact that the majority of recipients of TANF are actually white, it's a program that is coded as being uh, for black moms, young black moms, single black moms. Um, and I think that, you know, the 96 TANF reform doubled down on that. It didn't alleviate that. Whereas if we had a universal child grant, I don't think that it would be so heavily racialized, so judgmental. Instead, it would just be for all parents. And so, you know, I don't know that that kind of solves the the problem of racism at the heart there, but it does vault over it, I guess. Um, so anyway, I think it's a really good, an extremely good and difficult question to be asking. I wish I had better answers for it. Um, okay, so uh, next question. For countries that have implemented UBI, what have been the results? Um, so to my knowledge, no country has implemented UBI. Um, okay. But we have lots of things like UBI and we have tons of data on the results. Um, there's a really great World Bank compendium um, uh, that looks through all of these. But you know, you can look at the Alaska um, oil dividend for results, um, all sorts of transfer programs. And I don't know, Sebastian, are there results that you like to point to as being particularly interesting from UBI type programs or UBI pilots around the world? Yeah, um, I think one that, uh has is 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 pretty rigorous is is the give directly uh cash transfer experiments in kenya uh, and east africa uh which which to your point show uh, no increase in spending on vice goods increase in productive activities that are going to lead to long-running economic growth like going back to school starting a business uh better health and education outcomes for children um two uh, pilots that are in effect here in the United States, uh, supported by the Economic Security Project. There's the Stockton Seed demonstration, which uh, a number of families in Stockton are receiving $500 uh, checks each month, no strings attached. Um, all of the, the data thus far has shown that those dollars are being spent on food, clothing, necessities, um, better outcomes in terms of reduced stress levels. Uh, the other one that is it's sponsored by uh, ESP uh, is the Magnolia Mothers Trust, which is a program that supports low-income families headed by single African-American women in Mississippi. Uh, similar results, uh, better outcomes in terms of uh, health and education. Um, there, uh, you also see a lot of paying down of credit card debt and uh, educational debt from uh, uh, the, these uh, for-profit colleges, the kind of prey on low-income folks who are trying to enter 
uh, the higher education market. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, there, I don't think there's been any study of, of UBI in any kind of program that's shown any negative effects. There's either been uh, kind of nil or positive. Yeah. So um, with that, it is, it is uh, unfortunately time for us to sign off, um, but I'd love to thank uh, everybody who set this up um, uh, and everybody who joined us. Um, so thanks to Future Tense, um, thanks to New America, to Arizona State, um, and uh, to Slate. Thank you to Sebastian, and um, thank you to all of you.